Hi, my name is Dr. Igor Tabrisian. I'm a qualified medical doctor with a background in integrative and preventative health. On this channel, I'll explore evidence informed approaches to optimize well being from nutrition, gut health to hormones, energy, and everything in between. Please note, this information I share is general in nature and not intended to be used as medical advice. Always consult your own healthcare professional before making any changes to your health routine. This is the introduction to the gut. The human digestive system starts at the mouth and ends at the anus approximately 11 meters along. And if you were to unravel the surface area, it had been estimated at about 180 to 300 square meters. So it's the largest organ in the body being the surface area of a doubles tennis court. The concept of a biome is not a new one and it is expanding all the time as we develop tests for each site. So we use the word microbiome for the gut, but you can have an oral microbiome, vaginal microbiome, nasal microbiome, even placental microbiome. The microbiome is one of several sites that we are mapping out. Uh, one way of analyzing its function is to consider that it converts foreign to self. So for instance, if you eat beef protein, that protein gets converted down to individual amino acids and you convert those amino acids to albumin, say. So its function is to reallocate the resources in things that we eat. The process of moving something from one end to the other is called peristalsis. It's a series of connected and synchronized muscular actions to propel something in one direction. The time of such movement from one end to another is called the transit time. Uh, and currently, well, when I was a student, the normal range for bowel motions was three times a day to once every two weeks. But I think most people would agree that it's quite uncomfortable to wait two weeks to have a bowel motion. This series of nerves that contracts is a combination of various parts of the nervous system, some in the cervical spinal cord, the sacral spinal cord, and the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve is an interesting one because it too is 11 meters long, beginning in the back of the head, coursing all the way through the head, neck, chest, abdomen, and down to the perineum. First time I'd ever heard of the spinal column being adjusted to help with um, gut disorders was uh, there was an article in our local paper of a chiropractor that was helping little kids or infants actually with reflux and colic. And those adjustments were integral in removing the symptoms. Internally, the speed and synchronization of peristalsis is determined by the enteric nervous system, which is huge, it's massive. It, if you think about the unraveling of the whole intestinal tract and that surface area covering 180 square meters, you can see the size of the enteric nervous system. To give you a state of the scale, 90% of all serotonin is actually made in the enteric nervous system and only 1% in the brain. The same with the neurotransmitter GABA. Most of it, 90% is made in the gut, not in the brain, which makes you wonder what could its major function be outside the central nervous system. Um, so more on this when we do the neurotransmitter streams. But to give you an idea, there's two things that the neurotransmitters are doing in the gut. One is making an analysis of inflammation that could be relevant to the brain. So it's kind of like a reconnaissance system. And the second part is to manage 
the correct peristalsis so there's no holdups. So, for instance, when serotonin might be low in the gut, you might get um, unexplained abdominal pain. You might get um, episodes of reflux or reverse peristalsis. And these will be often misinterpreted as other things. So in various parts of this alimentary tract, there are bacteria that help or hinder the process of digestion. Think of them like stevedores or wharfies at the harbour. They are there to unload all the good stuff, all the zinc, magnesium, amino acids, fats, sugars, proteins, etc. if they like you. And they are also there to unload all of the toxic waste into the bowel. When you think about it, going to the toilet has been often uh, renamed as elimination, and that's a lot of that falls on the shoulders of the gut bacteria. So if we took all of the gut bacteria out of a human adult and weighed them, that would be seven, 700 grams, which is a pound and a half. And if you think about how small they are, that's actually 10 to the 13 number of bacteria. So that's 10 with 13 zeros after it. So that's a lot of bacteria. It's actually almost one for every cell in the body. And we, when we come to the virome, which is the virus colonies that live in our gut, there's twice as many of them. Uh, that is two by 10 to the 13. Um, numbers. So the total number of species and diversity has been found to be about a thousand species and possibly climbing. This is the gut bacteria. In the virome, it's upward of 40,000 different types of viruses that live there. So it's a pretty daunting kind of field. We're just getting our heads around understanding microbiome testing. But when the virome testing comes in, there'll definitely be a rabbit hole that we have to go down. So one of its functions of the gut in the context of converting foreign to self is reducing the immunogenicity of what we eat. In other words, the, the things that we eat could harm us. And so the process of digestion is to make them inert. Um, so, for instance, if you eat a protein, you want to get the all the amino acids out of that protein intact so they can be transported into the bloodstream where they won't create an immune reaction. So imagine if you blended your breakfast very, very finely and tried to inject it via a vein, you'd be dead before you finished, and then you could swallow the same liquid. So that's the power of the digestive tract, making things inert, converting foreign to self. Then we have the concept of the good and the bad bacteria. It's not quite as simple as that because you can have bad bacteria in low numbers in the intestinal tract. And they can thrive if the good guys um, get wiped out. So if something destroys the good bacteria, what you tend to find is that it's a power vacuum and you'll get a colony rising of normally minor colonies that will cause trouble. Um, e. coli and clostridium are good examples of this. Now, most of the E. coli are actually helpful and benevolent, but there's a few bad eggs in that. And there's one particular species called the 0104 colon H4. These are called the entro aggregative E. coli. And this strain is often a byproduct in our food chain of feeding beef cattle with corn instead of grass. So for beef cattle, in an attempt to avoid this, beef cattle farmers will try to put their cattle onto grass six weeks prior to slaughtering to prevent this um, contamination, or they'll just give them broad spectrum antibiotics like cephalosporins. And uh, every so often new cephalosporins are being added to approved um, farming antibiotics. And in fact, in this country, Australia, 75% of all the antibiotics used are not used by doctors, they're used by farmers. Then the next example is the Clostridia species, Clostridiums. 
a bit of a mouthful that one. In general, the these group are helpful because they make a compound called butyric acid in the gut, which adds a protective layer along that um, uh, the intestinal lining to prevent um, damage by foodstuffs that might do that. Um, and butyrate is really important for preventing um, severe reactions and keeping the coalface between the what you're eating and and your gut lining. But there are some Clostridium species that are um, dangerous. Uh, one that's probably the most famous is Clostridium difficile. Clostridium difficile can be ingested from things like raw honey. And this is why honey shouldn't be given to children under two years of age because they may not have the protective complement of bacteria to protect them against Clostridium difficile. And actually, in this country, um, people who sell honey, raw honey, have to submit samples for microbiological safety checks. And if you ever go to a place like that, you should ask to see the current certificate. The bacterium can also arise from the use of broad spectrum antibiotics and the commonest tests that doctors do apart from say parasites and standard stool samples is a test for clostridium toxin clostridium difficile toxin you probably won't see much of it in general practice but but you might certainly in hospital medicine we used to see a fair bit of it so that's kind of an overview of the gut where we're going to go I'll also cover topics like leaky gut, uh, in, um, IBS, inflammatory bowel disease, things like you know Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, ulcers, stomach ulcers, cancer of the gastrointestinal tract, reflux, chronic constipation, pancreatitis, and gallstones. So I hope you enjoyed that, and we'll see you in the next YouTube podcast.